Good morning to all of you in Missouri Auditorium and to the thousands that are apparently watching on the web. We're delighted to have you join us for the 13th annual David E. Barnes Global Health Lecture. Every year, the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research and the Fogarty International Center join forces to bring a true leader in global health and international science here to Bethesda to address us in the name of one of global health's champions, Dr. David Barnes. Dr. Barnes came to NIH, specifically to NIDCR, after a long and successful career in global oral health at the World Health Organization. And the first Barnes lecture took place shortly after he died in 2001. This year's Barnes lecturer is not only a prominent leader in global health, he's arguably one of the makers of our modern world. He is, of course, Bill Gates. Some have wondered whether Bill and I were the same person because we look somewhat alike, but you can see <laughs> today we are going to be visualized in the same location. So unless one of, them, one of us is a hologram, the rumor can now be put to rest. Uh, somewhere between MS-DOS and Windows 2000, and inspired by a visit uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Bill and his wife Melinda had begun looking to establish a philanthropic path that would allow them to help others living under less fortunate circumstances. And in 2000, they established the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thirteen years and approximately $28 billion of giving later, think about that for a minute, $28 billion, the Gates Foundation stands as a leader in the fight against many of the world's leading causes of death and disability. In fact, uh, Bill and Melinda have transformed our approach to global health. They've catalyzed the private sector, pioneering agreements in intellectual property to improve prospects of patient access. They've created some of the most important tools through this foundation of the past five years, including the meningitis vaccine, a point-of-care diagnostic for TB, and synthetic artemisinin to ensure supply of this critical malaria therapeutic. NIH actually supports about 40% of global health research R&D. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation support about 17%. All other entities uh, contribute the rest, but it's a long drop to the next uh, most significant contributor. So between these two organizations, NIH and BMGF, uh, we have worked together in a very substantive way uh, to try to advance the cause of global health research. And that includes HIV AIDS, malaria, enteric infections, tuberculosis, and many others. We've also helped to team uh, to train researchers and medical personnel throughout the developing world. Today, uh, Bill has been with us since early morning, visiting a tuberculosis laboratory in Building 33, meeting with some of the institute directors and speaking to the press. The word visionary is certainly overused, but I think for today, our speaker redefines the word. Bill Gates sees what is absent, and he sees what should exist in that space. He sees solutions from the micro to the macro level that no one envisioned before him. More than that, he has the energy, the perseverance, uh, to give concrete form to his visions, and so transform the world. So speaking today on why the future needs biomedical innovation, Please join me in welcoming the most incredible second act of the modern era, <laughs> Bill Gates. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, this lecture was scheduled uh, about a month ago, but you know, somehow you weren't allowed to do your work at that point. Uh, so I'm glad we got a, a chance to reschedule it and, and get together. Uh, this is a very exciting day. Uh, it's, you know, the first day I've been out to tour some of the great work we're doing together, including seeing the, the TB lab. Uh, also later today, Francis Collins and I will go uh, to the uh, White House area where there'll be a, uh, an event talking about uh, AIDS, and in particular about the progress Global Fund has made uh, in raising money to get the life-saving drugs out to patients. Uh, and I think the news that will come out of that will be very positive uh, because it's an incredible story, and even in tough financial times, 
Uh, the U.S. and a number of other countries are really stepping up in a, in a very big way uh, so that, the, uh, in that case, AIDS, malaria, and TB interventions get out uh, at very, very large scale. I want to thank you for your partnership in uh, many things that we do uh, together. Uh, it's a very broad partnership, uh, uh, touching a lot of your different institutes. You know, we have goals uh, in common in terms of uh, improving health and really understanding what's the cause of the disease and, and therefore what, what these interventions can look like. And it's great to see that the partnership is growing over time. Uh, a lot of it relates to infectious disease, but now it's broadening out uh, into things like nutrition, preterm birth, uh, mental capabilities of infants in uh, places where they've been exposed to lots of different diseases and, and how we can improve that. So we're just at the beginning of, of what we can uh, do together, I believe. Well, our foundation uh, uh, conceptually uh, existed uh, when I was fairly young because I knew that uh, uh, with Microsoft's success, the amount of wealth that was being generated was way beyond what would make sense uh, to ever give to my children. And so in my 30s and 40s, you know, I was thinking, okay, what type of scientific research, what thing uh, should I be involved with? Uh, and then when Melinda and I were married, we together were brainstorming about that. Uh, one interesting milestone was we saw an article that talked about 250,000 kids a year uh, dying of rotavirus. Uh, of course, a diarrheal disease. And neither of us had ever heard of that. And we thought, well, this is very strange. What, you know, given that death level, there must be gigantic work uh, going on and making sure the intervention gets out to all the kids in the world and, and bring, these, uh, bring this death level down. In fact, what we found out is that the vaccine that was available uh, was only being given uh, in the rich world where the risk of disease and certainly the risk of death was dramatically lower. And in fact, it wasn't going to get out to poor countries uh, based on previous experience for 15 to 20 years. And so that really drew us into understanding uh, infant mortality and what was the cause of it and were there a few things that were major and really trying to understand uh, who should be funding the R&D in those areas? Who should be funding the delivery in those areas? Who should be making sure that the primary health care system that has the workers and the supply chain and the cold chain in it is working on behalf of all these children? And in seeing that there were certainly some missing pieces there, we decided to make that the primary focus of our foundation. So the majority of the uh, grants we give and our, our activity are related to global health. Uh, we have a, a, a complementary programs in areas like agriculture uh, so that kids get more nutrition. And we have a few other things like sanitation that particularly as you get urbanized, uh, coming up with pleasant and uh, disease-free uh, sewage disposal is something we think will be a great intervention. But most of it is in the global health area, which is why uh, we have uh, so much in common. Vaccines have turned out to be the biggest area of our work. It's not the only area. Uh, we work on TB drugs, uh, which was the uh, seeing the robotic screening thing that you have this morning in the BSL-3 area. Uh, that's looking at drug libraries that, through our partnerships with the pharmaceutical companies, we've asked them to make those available. And uh, you've done state-of-the-art assays now that are, are finding some of these drugs that are, are very, very promising. So. Uh, we do malaria drugs, TB drugs, but a lot of our activity uh, is focused on vaccines because vaccines, after all, are pretty magical. Uh, over time, the cost of making most vaccines will get down to something like 20, 25 cents per child treated, uh, and yet it can give you lifelong protection. And so the, you know, two of the greatest achievements uh, in the history of health, one is the use of smallpox vaccination in the 1970s uh, to get, make that the only human disease so far that's ever been eradicated. But the second big thing, which actually averted even more deaths, uh, was a leader of UNICEF, Jim Grant, in the 1980s, uh, who drove the, the extended program for immunization and got immunization rates, which were 20% when they started, up to somewhat over 70%. 
Uh, now that's not 100%, and of course we need uh, you know, somewhere about uh, six to eight additional vaccines to get into that package. Uh, but that really had this incredible effect. In fact, if you look at mortality rates, uh, the, there was a great decline in the 1980s because of the API program getting out there. Now, after he left, the focus on that declined, and actually vaccination coverage went down somewhat, and very few new vaccines came into the picture. And so part of the goal we have is to reinvigorate that, get, get new vaccines in, uh, and get uh, the coverage rates up to a, a much higher level. This chart you know, sort of is the progress indicator uh, of, of a key element of health. That is, how many children under the age of five uh, die every year? And it's a pretty stunning story that I wouldn't have been aware of uh, until I got involved in the foundation work. In fact, it's a piece of good news that I wish you know, everybody understood. Back in 1960, the global birth cohort was about 80 million. And so what you see is about 25% of all children were dying before the age of five. Uh, now, uh, the birth cohort, uh, which has peaked uh, actually about seven years ago, was the largest number of children that will ever be born as we're projecting out uh, population trends over the next uh, 100 years. Uh, it's only come down slightly, and it's about 135 million. And so you see that we're, uh, we're slightly below a 5% rate. That is, we've gotten from 25% to 5% in terms of the kids who die under 5. It's still a tragic number, 6.6 .6 million. Uh, and I don't think there's a broad awareness of, of this big number. You know, you'll talk to people and say, wasn't that typhoon terrible? And, you know, I gave money for it. But as a percentage of those childhood deaths, the numbers that are related to natural disasters is very, very small. Those are important things. You know, the foundation gives to those. But it's this every day, one child at a time, death from pneumonia, diarrhea, uh, malaria, and a variety of, of causes, particularly for children under uh, 30 days of age, uh, that's causing this death rate. I believe that with the right kind of research that all of you are involved in and the right type of delivery activities, uh, that we can get this number down below 3 million uh, in the next 15 years. Now, that's a very ambitious goal. Uh, it will require uh, malaria to essentially drop to zero, uh, diarrhea and pneumonia to drop very much, and for us to make uh, progress on uh, a number of other areas as well. The effect of the, these vaccines is truly miraculous. Uh, measles vaccine, you probably know, costs about 12 cents. And um, the only reason we still have measles is we're not getting the coverage levels you would need to be able to do a disease eradication. It hasn't been targeted at this stage for eradication because it's incredibly transmissive. It's actually one of the most transmissive pathogens there are. In fact, if you want to really know whether your data measurement system that's trying to tell you how well you're doing on vaccine coverage, whether it's working or not, one of the best things you can do is, is sort of a, a double check is to see if there's measles. If you're not getting very high vaccine coverage, you will have uh, measles and pertussis will, will start to show up. And that can tell you that your way of, me if, if, if people are telling you you're getting 95% uh, or higher coverage, that will belie that. It will say that there's something wrong with your data system. So it's kind of a, a nice check, almost a canary in the coal mine type uh, indicator of what's going on. Now with measles, we don't just rely on routine immunization where you bring in kid kids at a particular age. We do a lot of campaign immunization as well. Uh, campaign immunization was, of course, used in smallpox. It's used very heavily in polio. The biggest campaign immunization right now is actually uh, to complete polio eradication. Uh, polio eradication is something uh, that the foundation's very involved with, and there's a goal to get polio done by 2018. Uh, we have three countries, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, where we've never gotten to zero. And so we keep getting outbreaks in countries where we have gotten to zero, but those three are where it's the toughest of all to get the coverage rate, rates up. Uh, it's very doable, but it's kind of an amazing enterprise that's requiring a lot of dedicated workers, a lot of funding, and even innovation. Uh, things like using satellite maps to see where the villages are, to see where nomadic people move around. Things like taking uh, GPS trackers and putting them in 
the, with the vaccine team that carries around an ice chest that has the vaccine. If we put uh, uh, just a cell phone with a location tracker in there, at the end of the day, we can plug that in and see, did the team go exactly where they were supposed to go or didn't they? And that becomes kind of a quality check. So getting vaccination coverage up to the extremely high levels you need for eradication is quite difficult. Uh, if we can get polio done, that will give us the credibility to go on and take on things like uh, malaria and measles and come up with a plan, uh, particularly in a point forward where we'll have those tools. Now, research and delivery are very complementary and both very important. In the case of vaccines, uh, the organization was created uh, with the foundation being involved in this to get vaccines out to the, poor, the children in the poorest countries is called GAVI, uh, Global Alliance for Vaccines. And so what it does is it goes and it commits to large volumes of buying these vaccines to the manufacturers uh, so they can build out uh, their facilities and offer at a very low cost where they're not getting much uh, margin at all, but offer it uh, for the poorest children of the world. So it's about tiered pricing where these vaccines are being sold at a dramatically lower price than they're sold for in middle-income and high-income countries. Those countries are providing the, the payback to the R&D, the funding for future R&D, but in the poorest countries, it's really just the marginal cost. Uh, and this has been a, a very successful endeavor uh, Gavi has. It's delivered now uh, over 400 million vaccines that wouldn't have otherwise been delivered. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, meningitis. In Africa, there's a whole area uh, meningitis belt where they get Meng A uh, comes in seasonally and it's, it's a serious problem. A very specific vaccine was created that's about a 35 cent vaccine that's now going out in campaign format and really bringing meningitis levels down to very, very small numbers. In fact, as we complete going through that entire meningitis belt in the next two or three years, it'll be interesting to see how low we can bring that down. Uh, pentavalent vaccine, that's a construct that adds uh, to the normal DTP uh, uh, construct. It adds hepatitis B and HIB. Uh, and it's very nice from a delivery point of view that by doing that combo for the actual primary health care worker, you're just still giving that one shot. But in fact, it's got the five different uh, vaccines are combined in there. And so if we're moving to DDP to pentavalent, we're almost done with that. The last few countries like South Sudan uh, uh, getting full coverage in India, uh, getting full coverage in Indonesia, those are being completed. So we're almost to the point where we can say every child in the world gets uh, pentavalent. Uh, we're not nearly to that point yet on rotavirus and pneumococcus, but we have a pathway where over the next six years we'll achieve, achieve that as well. So it's you know, big numbers and really getting out there. Of course, it's really uh, the kind of basic science work that you do that's made this all possible. Uh, if you go back to the 1920s and 30s, uh, that's where there was this observation that if you combine a protein with a polysaccharide, you get much better immunogenicity. Uh, so that observation was sitting there and uh, uh, coming out of uh, Avery and others at the NIH. Then later, uh, starting in the 60s but going into the 70s, 80s, that insight was used by people like uh, Robbins and uh, Schneerson to actually create the Hib vaccine. So what they did was they took the tetanus toxoid, the protein that's very immunogenic, and combined that with the Hib-specific polysaccharides and created a vaccine that's really quite amazing. So that's one of the components of this pentavalent vaccine. And very quickly when you get that out, out there, you can see that uh, Hib-related meningitis cases drop very dramatically, and you know it's a, a huge boon to the the health and the actual cost now of making that Hib component. Uh, it's come down to maybe you know 40 or 50 cents, and there's work ongoing work that should get that down so it's an even cheaper component. And you know so it's just common sense uh, that we ought to get that out uh, for everyone to take advantage of. Rotavirus. Uh, is an interesting thing because, as I mentioned, it was Melinda and I reading about rotavirus and all those deaths uh, that poor children weren't getting uh, a vaccine. That was one of the founding things that we said, wow, there really is a lot of low-hanging fruit where these lives 
are not being treated as being equal. In fact, we're allowing children to die who are just spending a few thousand dollars to raise vaccine coverage or to introduce new vaccines would save these lives. Uh, also, by getting the vaccines out, of course, you reduce the disease level and the impacts for the kids who do survive. And amazingly, and uh, some people would say paradoxically, as you improve health in these countries, uh, the families voluntarily choose to have less children. And so what you might think would be the case that if you improve health, you're actually raising population growth. That's the opposite of the case. And in fact, that's been seen in country after country. Uh, and so there's a, uh, a third benefit beyond death reduction and uh, sickness reduction is this fact that over time, the 3 and 4% population group level, growth levels, which essentially put you in almost Malthusian conditions where feeding, schooling, providing jobs, creating stability, is almost impossible. If you can get health there as a primary driver, you get population growth down more in the 2% level, and then those things become uh, far more tractable. So uh, our foundation actually in the early days did a lot in reproductive health. It was our primary focus because this issue of population growth, we hadn't understood the positive connection between health and improvement there. As soon as we, in, we were learning about that, that gave us the, the, uh, uh, the go-ahead to be really go after uh, the, these vaccine activities. Rotavirus, uh, today it's about, uh, about 20% of the children in the poorest countries receive the vaccine. As I said, it's, a, it's about a six-year pathway to get uh, to big volumes. A lot of these rotavirus constructs were uh, created here in NIH, and that uh, makes it available to different vaccine manufacturers, both in the rich world and some of the lower cost Indian and other developing country manufacturers are able to take your work and turn it into a manufacturing, uh, manufacturable con concept. There's another rotavirus <coughs> design which is actually unique, uh, comes out of India, that brought, uh, shows up here in 2013, uh, got their phase three approval for, and that will be a very low cost vaccine at about a dollar, which makes it feasible as we get the manufacturing volumes up, get the introduction done, uh, to, to over this time period, get it out to all children. Uh, at first, rotavirus was completely a paradox where it was given to rich children uh, and not to the poorest children, but that, that can be eliminated. Uh, but just between these two new constructs, you know, now that we've largely gotten pentavalent out to everybody, the big focus of Gavi is, is the pneumococcus and the, the rotavirus. Just those two alone in the uh, balance of this decade will save over 2.3 million lives. Uh, so, you know, very worthwhile, you know, kind of a miracle compared to all the, uh, the very tough other health problems that we talk about. You know, that is amazing. So anything that helps vaccines, you know, understanding adjuvants, manufacture, uh, making them lower cost, those are things that really have huge effect uh, on uh, global health. There are some areas which, you know, I'll just put forward that are still mysterious uh, and to achieve the ambitious goals, uh, we need your help in uh, understanding these things better. Uh, obviously, getting a, uh, a vaccine for a lot of diseases is tough. You know, in some cases, there is not natural immunity. So what we're asking uh, in terms of inventing the vaccine, it's not just to mimic uh, what goes on in disease, but, but something that goes even beyond that. It is amazing how the science has advanced and, you know, what the understandings are. And I'd say, you know, certainly I'm optimistic that we will uh, get an HIV vaccine, although there, you know, you couldn't give a time frame for it. You know, the, the progress in terms of the antibodies, a lot of uh, that work being done here intramurally and uh, a lot uh, through other laboratories as well is quite phenomenal. And, you know, so now the discussion about how could these antibodies be used? Could they be used for prophylaxis? Uh, do they have the right half-life? Do they have side effects? Can we make them at very low cost? Can they be used for treatment? Can they essentially substitute for some or all of the drugs? And even, you know, in the, in the ideal situation, cause enough suppression that you wouldn't have to have uh, ongoing daily treatment uh, the way that you do today. Compliance is still a big issue, and, and coming in even every 30 days to get a shot of antibodies would probably have better 
compliance than, than daily pills. Certainly on the prophylaxis side, that's the experience we've seen. Uh, you know, I'm showing here the, the uh, I think that's the BRC1 uh, binding, and then uh, over here on the right, I'm showing, you know, people trying to understand exactly how did this antibody evolve. And so if we want to have a vaccine that can create the same sort of cascade, uh, it's very complex how you have to direct the immune system to, to do something like that. But it's pretty phenomenal that we have tools now that we can see these things. And this is going to be phenomenal, not just for the HIV vaccine, uh, but for other ones as well. Uh, some very promising areas uh, that uh, we're jointly uh, focusing on are our new vaccine constructs, uh, DNA or RNA, you know, surprisingly, at least to me, uh, seem to work quite well, so there may be a number of diseases we can use that as a construct. Another one that I find fascinating uh, is using a viral vector, uh, specifically a, a Dino-associated virus, AAV, various types of that, to actually put in essentially an antibody factory uh, into the person's body. And so very quickly, as you're generating, if you're generating the right antibody, you get protection uh, uh, more rapidly than, than natural immunity, which for things like epidemic disease or prevention of bioterrorism seems very interesting. Just in the HIV case alone, <coughs> the view is that you could generate antibodies and, and have uh, lifelong generation from a single shot of this viral vector. And so there's a lot of challenges down the road to make that one work, but uh, because it would become a platform, uh, you know, I'm thrilled that the NIH and, and some other investigators we're backing are, are pushing that forward. A lot of the things that we can do with vaccines affect the uh, sickness and mortality after the uh, infant gets to 30 days. So 30 days to five years, uh, the understanding of what we would need uh, to get very, very low numbers is much better. The first 30 days, so-called neonatal survival, uh, you know, we need a lot more research. And here this just shows a trend that, as you'd expect, as diarrhea and pneumonia have come down, uh, those are 30 days to five years. That means the first 30 days, the percentage of childhood deaths has gone up to 44%. If you get outside of Africa, where malaria is still a huge component in the overall death rate, you get way over half of the deaths are in that first 30 days. So in, unless we develop fairly deep understandings of what goes on there, you know, this goal to, to cut these numbers more than in half won't actually be achievable. Uh, part of it, uh, not all of it, but a meaningful part comes from preterm birth. And there, uh, we were uh, talking to the director of NICHD today, you know, that we have a common goal that you know, in every country, uh, preterm birth is a, a huge problem. And what's known about how you intervene in that uh, is very limited. Uh, so, you know, we've got to fund the research and, and, and really understand uh, whether uh, we can come up with some additional tools. Uh, whether you look at, you know, the tragedy or the, the costs, uh, this is a, you know, very much a global thing. It's somewhat higher in Africa. Uh, particularly in malarious regions, but it's, it's not really low in any part of the world. And uh, uh, so that uh, is something we, we should be working on together. Another area that uh, it's even hard to measure the deficit that gets created is that a lot of the kids who survive because of either macronutrient or micronutrient or other deficits they've had, they're not developing either physically or mentally. And this is a huge problem for these countries because as they invest in productivity, education, the fact that the health status is what really creates a, a limiting factor, uh, you know, we've got to understand this a lot better. Obviously, everything I'm saying, you know, says that investing in research has huge paybacks. Uh, paybacks in improving the human condition, paybacks in reducing health costs as you get new tools, uh, and that's Certainly is true if you look at it globally uh, as if you just look at it for, uh, uh, for, one, for one country. Uh, as Francis said, NIH is the biggest funder of all this global health activity. This only covers uh, a small part of NIH budget, and it under-represents the basic research work you do that actually, of course, is extremely helpful for global health as, as well. Uh, but, you know... Uh, you know, we want other countries to step up. We're out, you know, talking to them about 
them getting involved. But in the meantime, uh, we are uh, very uh, dependent on the U.S. generosity. Of course, you know, we're deeply disappointed in speaking out as loudly as we can uh, that this is an investment that should grow in size over time. And so this is a chart I've seen in NIH publications as well uh, that talks about the relative situation uh, that other countries are stepping up, which is good. You know, this is not a zero-sum game. The more they spend, the better. You know, let's collaborate with them. Any, any cures will be used on a, on a global basis. But the irony that the U.S., in the face of medical costs, which if you take them out long enough in time, literally bankrupt the government, that the way you deal with that is you reduce medical research. It's got a certain deep irony uh, to it. So, you know, innovation is the solution uh, to making sure those, those medical costs don't expand. And, uh, you know, I'm an optimist. I think we'll, we'll be able to convince people uh, that those investments should be restored and grow. And uh, certainly our foundation will be doing its part to continue to stay focused in this. The global health priority will be, you know, what we're doing a decade from now, several decades from now, as long as there's health inequity, uh, that the poor children have more risk of getting these diseases, uh, there'll be a, a lot that we can do. And we're very excited uh, to be doing that in partnership with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill, uh, for an inspiring summary of many of the activities uh, that your foundation is working on and emphasis on the partnerships that we have between uh, the Gates Foundation and the NIH. In preparation for your visit, uh, we sent out a opportunity uh, to all of those on the NIH uh, staff list, which is about 17,000 people, uh, to suggest questions that they might want to have included in this uh, part of the session. And uh, we gave that uh, opportunity, therefore, for lots of different perspectives. Uh, and we got a very large number of responses. Uh, we've tried to sift through those. And I'm going to pick a few out that I thought uh, were put forward by quite a few people and were particularly thoughtful and sort of big picture kinds of questions. Uh, I think many people were interested in how the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation makes decisions about which areas of research uh, are the, your highest priority. And you've touched on quite a bit of that. But perhaps I'll ask, maybe even more provocatively, as we see infectious diseases increasingly uh, becoming uh, amenable to interventions, and the successes are remarkable uh, to point to, now we see the emergence uh, of non-communicable diseases as a most rapidly growing area of morbidity and mortality. What's the foundation's view about your role in tackling those conditions, things like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and so on, uh, which in the longer course of time may turn out to be an even greater threat than they are today? Well, the, um, yeah, the Global Burden of Disease website that I encourage everybody yes. to look at, because it takes these trends on a country by country, disease by disease over time, and really lets you look at it in a very rich way. It's fantastic. It absolutely shows what you say, which is that chronic disease, both in terms of uh, disability-adjusted life years, and it's not on there yet, but also in terms of cost, is becoming a very dominant uh, thing. You know, the sort of simple answer is that when you guys invent the equivalent of the measles vaccine, uh, that is a 12-cent intervention uh, that prevents diabetes, we will get right on making sure it gets uh, <laughs> delivered out to the poor world. Uh, you know, we're all about health equity. Uh, we look at uh, the impact we can have. You know, for example, there's early work on an RSV vaccine at the, the VRC. Yeah. That, you know, could be a cheap intervention which would save a lot of lives. So, yes, we would spend our money on advancing that uh, before we would on some chronic disease thing. Of course, you know, hepatitis B uh, vaccine is, you know, against a chronic disease. Uh, HPV vaccine will be delivered through Gavi over time, and so the work is to get the price down. Rwanda was the early pilot country that took right. HPV. They have an 80% take rate. Uh, that's 
about triple what the U.S. has managed to achieve at this point in time. Uh, so, you know, if we could catch up with Rwanda, it'd be nice. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, that'll get out there in, in big numbers. We're, a lot of what we're about is health equity. And so things have to be solved in the rich country. Uh, you know, like ARV medicines were invented, uh, you know, because there was a pain patient population. And it's wonderful that the marginal cost of making those drugs has come down where the actual cost of ARV treatment, the drugs are actually a small part of it. It's only $100 a year, and you're talking about you know, multiple pills being taken every day. It's actually the human costs are where the, the biggest costs are, and there's, there's room for innovation in that, that part of it. Uh, there are a few interventions having to do with you know, vitamins, maybe blood pressure, whose dollars per dally are getting into this really super effective range where we operate. And so we will be looking at, at things like that uh, you know, to make sure that they're, they're globally available. But dollars for DALI becomes an important part of your decision matrix. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we want to have as much impact as we can have. And so mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's a numeric exercise uh, that has to start by admitting that we can't take U.S. health care costs uh, and spend them in poor countries. So you mentioned uh, the challenge we have in the U.S. in, in terms of funding support uh, for global health research, which has certainly been a vexing problem here at NIH, although it is good to see other countries are um, emerging in interesting ways and making larger contributions. What about talent? Uh, how are we doing, Bill, in terms of are we training the right kinds of scientists, uh, physicians, and other participants in this important challenge? Uh, are the things missing? Are we doing the right thing as far as bringing in technologies that we need? Uh, are we on the right path in terms of the people part of this solution? Well, the, sometimes the technology you want to use, it's not obvious, and so people may have knowledge. Uh, you know, for example, on cold chain, most of the vaccines we're delivering have to be kept cold. And the idea of could you build essentially a super thermos that meant that you wouldn't need any energy input, mm -hmm. uh, which is very difficult out in the, uh, in the field uh, in many of these countries. The people who understood the ways you could build a super thermos, they never knew that they could help save lots and lots of lives doing that. So we need to challenge people from different realms. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have this reinvent the toilet challenge, uh, you know, those are bringing in chemists who never understood the chemistry of feces, we're teaching them. Uh, and you know, all you have to do to build a good toilet, you have to do two things. You have to make sure it doesn't smell, and you have to make sure you get rid of the disease-causing properties. Otherwise, it's just garbage. It, that is, in, in taking waste streams out you know, on a volume and mass basis is extremely inexpensive. But you need some pretty unbelievable chemists to, who can magically, without you know, piping in clean water or things that whose capital costs would be uh, infinite uh, relative to what's available, very difficult. I do worry, I think we, in terms of uh, uh, medical research, the limiting factor probably is funding. That is, I think the interest in working in these areas is high enough. Mm. You know, immunology, you could say, sadly got a big boost because of HIV. Uh, and you know, so now, you know, there are a lot of smart minds and a lot of people who'd like to work in that area. I think for the direct knowledge, it, a lot of it's funding limited. There is the challenge of developing expertise in the countries themselves where they, you have these heavy disease burdens. So particularly in Africa, uh, you know, it's ideal if you can get the scientific knowledge there and the treatment knowledge there to be much higher. And there, the gaps are, are, are pretty huge. And... Uh, you know, we're, we're only making modest progress. Now, using, you know, online teaching tools can help bridge the gap a little bit, but you still have to create some structure, some measure of excellence to make sure you're getting great people. And so the, there's, there's a lot more to be done. Uh, you and I talked a little bit a month or so ago about this idea of trying to pull together what's happening with MOOCs, these massive online courses. Uh, in the developing world, uh, low-income uh, countries where, in fact, there's a lot of interest in gaining expertise, both in terms of healthcare delivery and doing research, 
and as a part of the PEPFAR effort, uh, we're partnering uh, in the creation of this medical education partnership initiative. Uh, you obviously have another investment in the foundation in education, so you know a fair amount about what works and what doesn't. Can you just speculate for a minute about how we might try to make the most of what is a growing sort of <clears throat> inter-university, south-south kind of partnership and use new tools uh, to try to bring capacity forward in ways that hasn't happened yet? Well, yeah, so about uh, a little less than 25% of the foundation this work is not on global issues. It's specifically on U.S. education, and that's where we've been the biggest funder of MOOCs uh, and seen where those can help. Education really has two key parameters. One is the personnel system with how you manage the teachers. How do you select them, motivate them, measure them? That's a huge thing. And the second is student motivation. Mm -hmm. you know. And basically, if you have enough student motivation, then everything is easy. You just hand them... You, know, you want to learn physics, you hand them the Feynman lectures and say, read these. You, know, you want to learn molecular biology of the gene, just you know, hand them the Watson book and say, read this thing. So the, the knowledge is available. Uh, so why, you know, why is a MOOC better than a textbook? Well, it has to do with human motivation. People watching a video lecture where there's somebody interesting who's giving examples and where it's stopping and forcing them to answer a few questions so you can see if they're gaining that knowledge that works better than just throwing them the textbook and telling them, hey, why don't, why don't you go and read this thing? Now, now, the question of what kind of students does MOOCs work for, it works for the more motivated students. And those students are still going to get confused. They'll need some ability to get their question answered. You know, what can you do with online tools to make sure that you're uh, answering those questions at the mm -hmm. time that people want it? It's still kind of early stages. It's very exciting, though, that a large cohort who otherwise wouldn't have had the access to a first-class education will be able to get it through these online means. And certainly the cost, you know, the transmission, various things like that, even in Africa where it's quite terrible today, into the place where you're doing medical training, that will not be a, a limiting factor. And so, yes, we, it is an interesting to take our global health interests and our education interest and say, okay, at least in terms of training primary health care workers, mm -hmm. uh, let's make sure we're using the latest tools. Most of the things we're involved with don't involve doctors much at all. Uh, most of it involves primary health care. That's mm -hmm. you know, how vaccines are delivered. That's how most deliveries are done. Now, there are things where we escalate up to secondary and tertiary care, and we want to make sure that's available. But the sweet spot for us is that, that district health commissioner who's managing the primary health care system. Mm -hmm. How excellent are those people? Uh, and the answer is not nearly as good as they need to be. Uh, and so the tools could have a big effect there. You've thought a lot about how to encourage investments in global health, both in terms of the research and the distribution. Uh, and obviously intellectual property gets to be an interesting topic in that regard uh, where it can be an incentive but it can also be an obstacle. Uh, what are your conclusions about how we in the global health arena should be thinking about IP and the role it should play with the work we do here and the work that you do and all the other parts of this ecosystem? Well, IP is a complex topic, but there would be no pharmaceutical industry without IP protection. Absolutely. And, you know, it's unfortunate that the R&D success of pharma over the last decade hasn't been higher because if it had been higher, they would have bigger R&D budgets. And they are very, very important. When it, you know, it comes to inventing new vaccines, there's a part of it where their skill set, certainly the manufacturing, the phase three trials piece, they are the best. Uh, and we've reached out to them uh, uh, Trevor Mundell and I, uh, Trevor who runs our global health program, and I meet with these uh, head of the pharma companies on a very regular basis. And there's not a month that I'm not calling up several of them asking, could you help with this, could you help with that? Including things like the, the global, uh, the TB drug accelerator, where they've made some of their, their libraries available uh, at no cost to, to do those, those kinds of screens. So, uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, 
you know, something where the, the IP has been beneficial, um, particularly if you bring into it the notion of tiered pricing, that, you know, for the poorest countries, it should be marginal cost pricing. Mm -hmm. And pharma is really going along with that. Now, how many tiers there should be, you know, what tier does India belong in? Well, India actually mm -hmm. belongs in two tiers. The public health system belongs in the lowest tier, but then there's enough uh, uh, middle class people that you want to uh, be getting some R&D recovery from them. India's the toughest. Usually you can use country boundaries as a proxy for where pricing should exist in this tiered system. Mm -hmm. You know, most of Africa should have Gavi type pricing, which is the lowest pricing that there is. You know, every once in a while we'll have a middle income country step up and say, well, why don't I get the same price as they get? And the answer is because we're supposed to fund R&D. Uh, and the IP system is what makes sure that in some cases you can collect the money to fund the, the fixed costs of R&D. We really haven't found IP to be that much of a block. Uh, you know, the drug industry at first made a mistake not understanding tiered pricing for AIDS drugs, mm -hmm. uh, but then fairly quickly mm -hmm. they realized that was not uh, the right thing. And yes. ever since then, they've been you know, kind of amazing that you know, there is no IP payment. When people are buying ARV drugs, that is the, the very basic chemistry you know, of what it costs to make those things. There is no IP whatsoever in, in the, the broad PEPFAR global fund type uh, drug delivery programs. Another part of that, of course, is data access. NIH is pushing as hard as we can in all sorts of fronts about trying to make sure uh, that data, once it's obtained, is accessible even before publication and even digging down into materials that might not appear in the publication. How big an issue is that, in your view, in terms of the global health issue, just getting access to the data you need to see? Yeah, well, striking the right balance on these IP issues and access to to data is, is a piece of that. It's very hard. Uh, but you need people who are serious understanding how important IP is so that you really have a trade-off that you, you don't want to uh, destroy a lot of what, you know, has, has created most of these, these wonderful new tools. And we fund some of the public library of science type journals related to the diseases that we're particularly active in. You know, we look at our grants in terms of what sort of website should there be for the various diseases that you're sharing different things. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at the samples that have been gathered in various studies, and it's amazing how many times we think, oh, gosh, if we'd just taken more samples, you know, then we could go back and look at this thing or that thing. It's true of some of these HIV trials that, you know, in retrospect, uh, we wish we had more blood at more regular intervals to, to see certain type things. So learning about that and how much do you fund those types of things that, you know, when you have a narrow purpose you might not do, but because we're in this for the long term and, you know, the particular study you're doing might not work, but the samples might help you with some scientific understanding. I think we're getting smarter about that. And we haven't run into much resistance for the things we fund for the data to be published. Um, you know, if that's the key to the IP protection, though, then you, you do get a, uh, sometimes a paradox. Bill, you have uh, a bit more than a passing familiarity with software and the uh, Internet, and uh, <laughs> various uh, people have made statements uh, some recently about just how crucial it is uh, for all of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to become accessible to the Internet, and certainly the availability of cell phones has transformed the ability to do communications, and you mentioned a couple of examples, particularly connected with GPS. But how much do you see uh, the potential uh, of internet access and the almost universal uh, cell phone access as part of ultimate solutions uh, in global health? I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, it's not as many, some people will tend to over state, you know, how helpful it is. I mean, you know, if, if you have malaria in your country, no degree of cell phone coverage will really uh, <laughs> reduce that. It's not uh, a treatment. No. You, and so, you know, if you have very finite dollars, then, you know, internet coverage won't make the top of the list. Then on the other hand, uh, we have this um, uh, uh, birth 
uh, checklist uh, project that we're doing with Atul Gawande, which is up in Uttar Pradesh in India. And when you look at how bad the compliance of the healthcare workers against the things you want them to do is, you know, you very quickly go, wow, you know, if we could have a camera in there that you know they they knew was checking on them and and literally sometimes it could check on those things to drive a quality measure mm. you know then we could get the checklist to be initiated and in india it's it's scary a little bit because we're driving delivery into the facilities and if we're not careful we'll be back in the 1800s where literally you caused more uh mortality because those became sources of infection uh as opposed to, to delivering out, outside the facility. Uh -huh. And so there's many countries you don't want to force this thing prematurely. You've got to have a certain level of quality uh, before it becomes a, a net benefit. So I do think in terms of helping train workers, helping give advice to workers remotely, helping make sure that supply chain of you know, drugs and tools, including the, the subset that's cold chain, the vaccine piece, I do think these digital tools for measurement, and quality of activity are going to be just phenomenal. And even for some areas of diagnosis, you know, you've got the camera and the processing and things like that. I think it's going to be phenomenal. It's not yet at the point where we're able to replace paper records. You know, paper is very low power, uh, you know, very reliable. Uh, you know, it just works really well. And most of the cell phone-based systems we've put in so far don't make that test. But over the next five years, we will replace a, part, a lot of that paperwork. Um, and we've got to make sure that it, it doesn't require more training of the healthcare workers and that it's got incredible reliability characteristics. But it, it will come in slowly but surely. It'll come in first in middle-income countries. You know, it, it, most people... I'm afraid don't understand that the difference between, say, uh, you know, say China and Democratic Republic of Congo, the U.S. and China are much more similar in terms of what goes on in medicine than China is to sub-Saharan Africa. And so the term developing country is a very misleading term, probably shouldn't be used anymore, because you're talking about more than a factor of 50 in GDP per person Whereas there's only a factor of five G difference in GDP person between China and ourselves, there's a factor of 50 difference between China and the poorest countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And what that means in terms of health care is really like night and day difference uh, you know, in terms of what's available. Most people are born and die and never see a doctor, never will see a doctor, not even in the distance will they ever see a doctor. Bill, you mentioned polio is just an incredibly important task uh, to try to achieve that magic number of zero, and yet the last 1% uh, has proven to be particularly challenging and has put you in a position of not only uh, leading a foundation, thinking about the science and all of the logistics of distribution, but also in a diplomatic role. I know you were just in Nigeria uh, trying to see what could be done about the difficulties in northern Nigeria in terms of vaccination. How is that part going, and what's that experience been like? Well, Nigeria's um, very important. It's you know, over a quarter of the population of sub-Saharan Africa is in one country, 170 million people. And the health statistics are horrific. Even though Nigeria is nowhere near as poor as the average of sub-Saharan Africa. They're above average because of the oil wealth, and yeah. yet they're way below average in terms of health outcomes, particularly in the north. Yes. So uh, immunization coverage is better in Somalia, where you have no government at all, than it is in northern Nigeria, where you have a government. Uh, it's about a 30% coverage rate. And so that means that, you know, take any disease, measles. Measles is, is hugely endemic up in northern Nigeria and killing lots and lots of, of kids. And the, once your vaccine system breaks down, then mothers don't know that they should bring their kids in at these various ages. If they come in uh, and the right things aren't there, then it breaks that model down. And Nigeria designed a system that the national government provided the vaccines, the state level government provided the salaries, and the, the, another government level provided the electricity. And so if any one of three levels hadn't done their job, then when mothers show up, 
they get told, come back later. And so the whole notion of should you bring your kids in, what is routine immunization, largely breaks down. Now, these things are being redesigned to, to be more reliable, uh, more measurable, but it's going to take quite a while to get that really in, in shape. And so it means polio is tough. We have to rely on huge campaigns to go out and reach all the kids. In Nigeria, we have all the problems you could imagine because we have rumors that the vaccine is bad for you, uh, that it you know, sterilizes kids or causes bad side effects. And we have violence. The group there is called Boko Haram that has killed polio vaccinators and, and prevented the vaccination from taking place. So you, we can argue about whether Nigeria or Pakistan will be the last place in the world where we have polio. But it's one of those two. Now, I don't mean to paint a negative picture. It's, it's a challenge. But we have less cases uh, in Nigeria than we've ever had. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, polio's got three types. We haven't seen a type three case uh, there in, in uh, the last year. Uh, we mostly have type one at this point, and the genetic variation shows us that we're, we really are making pro progress. But up in the Northeast, there's some areas where our, our coverage rates just aren't adequate. And it's a lot of kids. What you don't like in polio is a lot of kids, bad sanitation, and the kids move around a lot. And so you might think, well, how come, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo is not the last place with polio? The answer is the kids don't move around a lot. Uh, and so your force of infection is very different. India was the place that was by far going to be the hardest. 21 million kids born every year. The movement rates are mind-blowing. The, the, you know, even the poorest family can, can get on Indian rail and move. And if they think there's a job, you know, a thousand miles away, they will go. And... You know, Indian Rail has the worst sanitation of any <laughs> rail system in the world. Uh, and so the, the fact we got India to zero by January 2011, that was a big milestone. Amazing. Now we need to get one of Nigeria or Pakistan to zero in the, the next couple of years, ideally both. And that would you know, get us on the path to finish around 2018 or so. We need three years where we have no, uh, no cases, where we still have to keep the immunization levels very high. And OPV is not the world's best vaccine, uh, either in terms of efficacy or in terms of side effects. And so how we move from OPV over to IPV is super complicated. In fact, some of the most advanced disease modeling work and funding work uh, relates to this end game challenge we have, particularly as it relates to type 2 polio. Well, Bill, you and I are both supposed to be in the White House in about 62 minutes. And... Uh... I have to apologize, therefore, ahead of time to all of those people who probably wanted to mob the stage and get an opportunity uh, to speak with you. But I do want to thank the folks who are here and the 3,700 people that I hear are watching on the web and maybe ask you one final quick question. We are, the, between NIH and your foundation, the largest supporters of global health R&D. Uh, any recommendations you would have right now to this audience uh, about how we could be even more effective in that synergy between our organizations? Are we on the right track? Anything that we would need to institute that we haven't done yet? Well, it's always hard to prioritize. Um, yeah. You know, there's human disease uh, gives you a lot of things. You know, I'm a big believer in taking the, uh, the things that cause huge impact, preterm birth, Nutrition, you know, in your case, neurological, we're not uh, involved in that. These sure chronic disease conditions, uh, you know, really need big focus. There's a few things in the global health area that need really big focus. And so hopefully we'll drive each other to be a little more focused on these things. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll drive each other to tell the success stories a little better. I mean... The success that's going on, in whether it's the aggregate rate or you take particular diseases, uh, and you know the promise, we don't, you've got to be careful not to own more promise, but the promise of the new tools we'll get for this next decade you know, are, are pretty phenomenal. And you know, clearly, even the elites of the country don't understand the success that's being achieved in global health. Uh, and they don't understand the fairly modest percentage of uh, dollars, either at the research level or at the delivery level, that go into those things. And so, uh, you know, we, this is the Internet age. Are we able to tell these stories better in that environment? Uh, so far, you know, that's an incomplete thing, and 
we, we have to work together on it. And we will. Please join me in thanking Bill Gates. Great. Thank you.